And no discussion of forces is complete without the, talking about Newton's laws. We have Newton's first law, which tells us that an object in motion stays in motion and an object at rest stays at rest unless acted on by an outside force. This law is also sometimes called by a different name. Sometimes we call it the law of inertia. And sometimes instead of this long phrase, we just use this word inertia, which means masses tendency to resist acceleration. So bigger objects are harder to push than smaller objects. So we can think about that conceptually. And sometimes we see this word inertia and we'll see it described in terms of something called an inertial reference frame. And that's actually nothing special. It's just a reference frame that moves with a constant velocity. So a reference frame without acceleration. Newton's second law is probably what should be the most famous equation in all of physics, though it really doesn't get that billing uh, too often. In words, we say Newton's law tells us that external forces cause acceleration. But in terms of an equation, we say that the sum of forces acting on something is equal to the mass times the acceleration of that system. And we can see an example of this. So here we have a sample problem where we're giving a particle that has some mass m equals 4. So there's my particle, that blue ball right in the middle there. It's acted upon by four forces of magnitudes F1, F2, F3, and F4, and these all have directions as shown in this free body diagram, which remember is the diagram that shows how forces act on an object. So what I can do is I can first draw a picture of this situation like every physics problem that we work on. And we've already been provided with that nice picture. And what I can also do is I can break this picture up a little bit. Anytime I have vectors moving off at angles, I have always done the exact same thing, and this is no exception to that rule. I need to break it into the x directions. So that's f1 x is going to be f1 times the cosine of this angle 30, because we are on the adjacent side of that triangle. And then we also have this little bit of guy f1 y going upwards, and that's going to be equal to f1 times sine of 30. So we've written out all of our vectors. Now how do I solve this problem? How do I find the acceleration? So I need an equation. Now the equations that we know for forces so far, we only know one. We know the sum of forces acting on something is equal to that object's mass times its total acceleration. So what this tells us is we've got vectors. right? These little lines above these means the that we're acting on vectors. So we have to do vector operations. So we should be thinking in terms of vectors. And anytime we have vectors, that means we break things into the x, y, and z directions. This is why you're given so much frickin' practice with vectors and breaking right triangles down. So what do we need to do? How do we solve this problem? The sum of the forces is going to be equal to the vector sum of f1 plus f2 plus f3 plus f4 plus f5. So let's write down all of these vectors separately. f1 we know is a combination of two different vectors. f1 is f1 in the x direction plus f1 in the y direction. So f1 is equal to f1 times cosine of 30 in the i hat direction plus f1 times sine of 30. So we can plug our numbers in and see that vector f1, if we start plugging in what we know, is 10 newtons times cosine of 30 in the i hat, plus 10 times sine of 30 in the j hat. So what we are doing here is breaking down these vectors. We are writing them explicitly out about what's going on in the x and what's going on in the y directions. So f1 in vector notation is going to be 8.66 newtons in the i hat, again just by multiplying these two numbers together, plus 10 times sine of 30, which is going to be 5 newtons in the j hat. f2, f2 is pretty easy to write because we don't have it going off in different directions. right? If we look at f2, F2 is going entirely down. 
so we don't have to break that up. F3, if we take a glance ahead, it's going entirely to the left. We don't have to break that component-wise. And F4 is going entirely up. So we don't have to break that into components. So we don't have any more components that we have to write out uh, for, for these vectors. We can simply write them down. So F2 was 40 newtons. And since that's going down, that's going in the negative j-hat direction. F3, F3 is going to the left. So that's going to be 5.0 newtons. And since it's going to the left, that's going to be in the negative i-hat direction. And then f4, that's going to be equal to 2 newtons. That's going up. And since it's going up, it's going to be the positive j-hat direction. So this is all stuff that we know. These are all known values. Now we need to ask ourselves, what are we actually looking for? Well, we're looking for the acceleration. So to get the acceleration, the only equation I know right now for acceleration involving forces is force equals mass times acceleration. So I need to figure out what this force is. And if I know how big the force is, then I can figure out how big the acceleration is. So to find the size of this force, I can do it a couple different ways. Let's first do it in components. Let's I can do it a few different ways. There's lots of options. I'm going to do it in terms of components. So I'm going to find the sum of forces in the x direction. And that's going to be found by just adding up the x pieces of force, which is going to be F1, the piece that's going in the x direction, plus F3, because those are the only two forces that are going in the x directions. So if I'm going to add these together, I take this force 1 in the x direction, that's 8.66 newtons in the i-hat direction, plus F3, which was 5.0 newtons in the negative i-hat direction. So because of that negative, I subtract these forces from each other, and I found that Fx is equal to 3.66 newtons in the i-hat direction. Now if I want to know what the acceleration of this is, I can set this equal to mass times the acceleration in the x direction. I know what my mass is. They gave us its 4 kilograms. So I can solve this. Ax is equal to 3.66 newtons in the i-hat direction. And then I divide both of these sides by m of 4 kilograms, because that's the mass of my particle. And I find that Ax is equal to 0 0.92 meters per second squared. Now, I also need to do this for the y direction. So what forces are happening in the y direction? Well, I have F1y plus force 2, which was going entirely down, plus force 4, which is going entirely up. So now I add up the magnitudes of all of these. Forces in the y direction are equal to 5 newtons in the positive j-hat, plus F2, which is 40 newtons in the negative j-hat direction, and then plus F4, which was 2.0 newtons, also in the j-hat direction. So I sum all of these up, just do regular old algebra, and I find that the sum of forces in the y direction, negative 37 newtons in the j-hat. I can convert this into the acceleration by saying this is equal to the mass times the acceleration in the y direction. Divide both sides of this by the mass to find that Ay is going to be equal to negative 37 newtons in the j-hat divided by 4.0 kilograms, the mass of that blue particle. So Ay is going to be equal to negative 8.3 meters per second squared. That's one way I could list this answer, but maybe I want it as just its actual magnitude. So what's the final magnitude of this? Well, let's draw our coordinate grid so we can see what this looks like. And we have a little bit of an acceleration going in the x direction, kind of over to the right. And then we have a little bit of acceleration in the y direction going down. And our total acceleration vector would be this hypotenuse. So Ax, Ay, and A total acting at this angle theta. So if I want to find A total, A total is going to be the square root of the sum of the squares, Pythagorean theorem. We will never escape Pythagorean theorem in physics. So we have ax squared, 0.92 squared, plus ay squared, 
negative 8.3 squared, take the square root of the sum of those squares, and we find that a total is equal to 8.4 meters per second squared. And we can find the direction of this by doing tangent of theta is equal to opposite ay over adjacent ax. Theta is the arc tangent of all of this, which is 8.3 over 0 0.92 and our theta, when we calculate this out, plug it into your calculators, is 84 degrees. But here we need to be careful, and we need to specify where it is relative to. That is 84 degrees, and typically we've been, we've been finding things that are above the x-axis. This one is below the x-axis, right? I'm going down. If I look at that picture, I can see it's below the x-axis. And that's one of the big reasons we draw these pictures all the time, so we can see what's actually happening. But this isn't the only way that we can describe Newton's second law. F equals ma is the simple version, but when Newton first derived it, he used a different one. So we have something called sum of forces, the net forces acting on something, is equal to m times acceleration. But acceleration, the way Newton formulated it, was dv over dt the derivative of velocity with respect to time. So now the forces, the net forces here, are equal to the mass times dv dt. Mass times the derivative of velocity with respect to time. And it turns out that this quantity we can rewrite as something else. We can write this as momentum. So net force is equal to dp dt, where this p represents a physical quantity that we're going to learn about called momentum. Very logical that we use the letter P to represent momentum. And here P is equal to M times V. And we will learn much more about this in a later chapter. And in some senses, we have a special case of Newton's second law, which is the force due to gravity, also known as weight. So Newton's second law tells us sum of forces is equal to mass times acceleration. When we write this in terms of weight, we uh, oftentimes will see force written as W. That stands for weight. Sometimes we'll also write it as F sub G, the force due to gravity. And that's equal to mass, whatever your mass is, times the acceleration caused by gravity, which we've learned is G for the Earth. So this is 9.8 meters per second squared if you're on Earth. And if we were to draw a free body diagram of this, here we've got a little person, we've got them standing, and we can draw the free body diagram of the forces acting on this guy. We have force due to gravity acting straight down. Weight equals m times g, or f sub g, force due to gravity. And that's enough about the second law. We also have Newton's third law, also known as the action-reaction. This tells us that every force has an equal and opposite force. And we can see an example of this as well. So let's look at this problem where we have two blocks that are at rest. We have mass one and mass two. They're sitting on a frictionless surface, so we don't have to worry about something called friction as we see below. Their block one has a mass of two kilograms, block two is a mass of six, and we are applying a force of 24 Newtons. Part A, find the acceleration of the system, Part B, suppose the blocks are later separated. What force will give the second block with the mass of 6 kilograms the same acceleration as the system of blocks? So if I just separate these, pull these blocks apart. So how do I find this? How do, what, what's going on here? Uh, part A, find the acceleration of the system. Let's write down everything we know. We know mass 1 is equal to 2.0 kilograms. We know mass 2 is equal to 6.0 kilograms. And we know that the force applied is equal to 24 newtons. And then relevant equations, we know Newton's second law, we know the sum of forces acting on anything, vector notation, is equal to mass times acceleration. And in this problem, we can see where this summation comes in. Right, That's the total force acting on everything. So this needs to be some kind of total mass acting on everything, and this has got to be the total acceleration. Now since these blocks, these are connected, these are attached together, right? We're pushing them together, so I can treat mass 1 and mass 2 as one big block in this equation. 
because they're combined there together. So as far as the physics is concerned, m is just m total, which is m1 plus m2. So I can find what mass total is by adding these masses together. 2.0 kilograms for mass 1 plus 6.0 kilograms for mass 2. So mass total is going to be equal to 8 kilograms. So now if I want the acceleration, I can solve this equation for acceleration by dividing both sides by mass. So acceleration is the sum of forces divided by the mass. And that's going to be equal to 24 newtons, all divided by the mass of 8 kilograms that we just found. So the acceleration that we're working with here is going to be equal to 3 meters per second squared. And what direction does this go in? This is going to be in the i-hat direction, as I can tell by the picture that is drawn. So part B asks us something slightly different. Part B asks, what if we separate these blocks so we split them up? Now this mass total is no longer going to be the combination of both blocks. What force will give the second block, so we're interested specifically in the second block, with the mass of 6 kilograms, the same acceleration as the system of blocks. So now I change up the variables a little bit. Right? I now know the acceleration that I'm interested in here. I'm not solving for that. I know what it is. I want the acceleration to be equal to 3 meters per second squared, what I found in part A. I want to know what force I need to apply to get this acceleration. If my mass is now changed so that the mass is only the mass of the second block. So the only mass I have here is 6.0 kilograms. So now F is still, according to Newton's second law, equal to mass times acceleration. So the force that I need here is the mass of 6.0 kilograms times the acceleration of 3.0 meters per second squared. Multiply these out and you'll find that your force is equal to 18 newtons. So in some sense, this problem actually represents every single one of Newton's laws. Newton's first law, the law of inertia. Heavier things are harder to push. And we can see that where the two blocks, which have a higher mass, we need a force of 24 newtons to push, whereas the one block, which is a little bit smaller mass, only needs 18 newtons. We see Newton's second law, where sum of forces is equal to mass times acceleration. So that's the equation that we actually use to do all of these calculations. And then we see Newton's third law with block one pushing on block two and block two pushing right back. So Newton's three laws of motion. So we've now seen an example that demonstrates all of Newton's three laws of motion.